I'd like to talk about uh, life in a very fundamental way today. I'm a, a biologist by training. I was trained by the man who discovered the structure of DNA, James D. Watson. I was then instructed by the man who learned to read the code of DNA. And that was followed by the man who learned to use genes uh, to make useful products. So I have, from the beginning of my career, been very steeped in a new understanding of the fundamental nature of life. I've gone on to work in, on medical problems of cancer and of AIDS. I've created a number of biotechnology companies to help turn that knowledge into useful medical products. And now I'm in the process of a different phase in trying to help restructure medical services so that knowledge is put to use for people in all countries, no matter their economic status. And so I have a broad perspective, but what I'd like to talk today about is some of the implications for all of us about what this new knowledge of life is. Let me just begin with a few comments about life itself. The first thing to appreciate is how powerful life is. Our planet, some four and a half billion years ago, was a rock that was cooling that had water on it. And that's all there was. There was rock and water, minerals and water, and a beginning of an atmosphere. But an atmosphere without any oxygen, or very small amounts of oxygen. Life began very rapidly. No one knows quite how, but we're beginning to understand how it could happen within about three or four hundred million years. And thereafter, these first simple and then increasingly complex forms of life have transformed that rock and water into our beautiful planet. It has softened our environment. We see these beautiful verdant hills. We see a sea full of life. We have an atmosphere full of oxygen, which is released from the minerals. Naturally, oxygen combines with minerals and wasn't there. Life is so powerful, it has transformed the entire surface of our planet. And it's transformed that through chemistry, through an enormous diversity of chemistry. Chemistry that works at the bottom of the sea, chemistry that works three or four miles beneath the Earth. Actually, most of the life on this planet is not visible on its surface, but is microorganisms that live hundreds and thousands of meters deep within the surface of the Earth. It's created this wonderful world of ours. That's the first thing to realize, that life is diverse, life is powerful. The second thing is life is intricate. It is very, very tiny. Now, we are not so tiny. A forest is not so tiny. A whale is enormous. But the unit of life is the atom. Life is architected, if there is an architectural dimension, on the basis of placement of individual atoms. Life is made up of very tiny parts, which assemble and make larger and larger parts. And as we have learned to take apart life, we understand that the unit that makes a forest, the unit that makes a human being, the unit that makes a microbe and a bacteria, the unit that makes a virus, is an atom and a collection of atoms between perhaps 100 and 2,000 atoms that are very precisely arrayed. They are so precisely arrayed that if one of those atoms is moved half a di diameter out of place, the function no longer exists. And that's what we can personally experience as an inherited disease. The information that makes that microscopic structure places one atom slightly off, and there's a dramatic disease, for example, sickle cell anemia or some other diseases. So life is powerful, and life is intricate. Another feature of life is that it is information. What is life but information passed from one generation to another generation? And as it is passed, it becomes more and more complicated. Originally, there were probably 
a very simple system that then over time created a slightly more complex system that created a slightly more complex system too. When I was an undergraduate, I had the great pleasure of working with a truly great scientist. He was putting some of the first instruments to fly by another planet, Mars. And the question he posed to this small group of undergraduates for the summer is what is life? What is the essential life? What do we think about if we find life in another area? Does it have to be our life or can it be anything? And we came up with an interesting definition. Life is information which can be transmitted from one generation to another in a system that makes mistakes and those mistakes are self-replicating. And that is the essence of life. It's the essence of information being passed from one generation to another, a machine that makes mistakes in that transmission, and then having the ability to replicate those machine mistakes. So that fundamental nature of life is information. And that information in most life forms that we know is encoded for by DNA. That is the molecule that encodes the information that transmits itself from one generation to another. And the way we now look at all living things, people suspected it, but now we know, is there was one original primordial form of life, which through evolution and time has adapted to different ecological niches through this fundamental information transfer. In one niche, it's one form. In another form, in one niche, it's us. It's a whale, it's a tree. But as you begin to understand this information and read this information, and now we can read the information for up to a thousand different species, both small and large, we realize that it has got a common origin, that the information that makes a small organism or that makes a human being is almost identical. It's just the way these parts are, in a re are rearranged. There are in life perhaps no more than 50,000, at maximum 100,000 parts. But these parts are all rearranged to make everything that we see today. So life is powerful. Life is intricate, architected at the atomic scale. And life is information. And there is one more feature of life that's important to consider. And that is life is immortal. Now, if we look out at a field and a mountainside, we will see these mighty rocks, boulders, cliffs, and we will think they are more permanent than that soft green cover that grows upon them. But in fact, it is the opposite. That rock, that mountain will wear away in time and has many times over. You know that mountain ranges rise and fall. But the life that lives on them is still there, is there for four billion years. In each of us is what I call the immortal molecule, DNA. And why do I call it that? Because if you consider what we know about that molecule, that it starts as a pair of molecules, each one templating the other, like a mold in its form, they're separated, and they form another mold and a form. And who's to say what's the original and what's the copy? Well, that process for this single molecule has been going on for four billion years. And in each one of us lives that immortality. Now, the form that carries that information from one generation to another may die. But the molecule is transmitted in a single unbroken chain. So the property that we think about life, which is birth and death, is an illusion. It's an illusion of our own making because the fundamental nature of life is that it is more permanent than the rock. It is as immortal as our planet is old. And it will be here for as long as our planet exists. So in that sense, life is immortal. Now, what does that have to do with our life today? Well, over my career as a professional, we have learned how 
to tap in to that power, that intricacy, that information, and that immortality. All of those things we now perceive. We are like Dr. Faustus, who's been given the book of knowledge. It is the first time that we have really appreciated. Imagine before Dr. Watson did his work, Dr. Watson and Crick, that the mystery of what was inheritance, what was the form of inheritance, was not known. We now know it. It's in a molecule that templates itself and copies itself. We know that. Through our ever-improving ability to understand that process, we can now read the entire text of an organism. We can now read in a few hours the entire text of a human being. I was involved with the Human Genome Project. I created the first company to take advantage of that new knowledge, a company called Human Genome Sciences, to turn that knowledge into pharmaceutical products. And then it took three billion dollars and ten years to sequence a human genome. Now it may take a thousand hours and a few hours, a thousand dollars and a few hours to do the same. So we now have enormous ability to understand this information. And it isn't just the information of a human being. We are now unlocking the information that's in very large parts of the biosphere. Let me just give you one example. There are people who have gone to the sea and scooped up seawater. And in a single drop of seawater, there may be 10,000 microorganisms, different organisms. You can take it, extract it, read the information without growing any of it, and you will have all of that information available. And that's the power that we now have. We have that power of transformation. We have the power of building intricate materials. We have the information we need to read and see and understand and correlate. And all of that power is in our hands. And what are we going to do with it? Well, we will, as we always do, satisfy our human needs. That's what we do with knowledge. That's what we have always done with knowledge. And our needs haven't changed in any really fundamental way. For example, we need energy. And we've always needed energy. We know that the first human beings used energy to keep themselves warm. Actually, people, species that were not human, our predecessors, had the ability to use fire some two to two and a half million years ago. And archaeologists are now believing it may be three to four million years old. Well, three or four million years ago, the animals that walked upon this earth looked a lot more like a different kind of species than they looked like you. You would not recognize them uh, as human. Yet they were using fire and using simple tools. Today, we have an enormous need for energy. Our lifestyle is more complicated. And we know the threat it poses to our environment. The only question we have, I think, is not whether our energy consumption is an environmental threat, but how immediate that threat is. We are now putting into our atmosphere 30 gigatons, that's a lot, 30 gigatons of carbon. To give you an, a, 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 a day, a year, excuse me. And what that means is we're putting an enormous amount of carbon that has not been there for a very long time. Where is that carbon from? Well, that carbon is a pro product of biological action over many hundreds of millions of years. There's been carbon in the atmosphere. There have been small microorganisms in the sea. There have been ancient forests that have taken that carbon out of the atmosphere and fixed it, buried it, and transformed it into oil, transformed it into coal. And what we are now doing is taking the carbon that is many hundreds of millions of years old, burning it, and pumping it into the atmosphere. It wasn't there. It hasn't been there for a very long time. We're not saying the carbon was never in the atmosphere, but it hasn't been there for a long time. And we are very well convinced that as that carbon level rises, the temperature of the Earth will rise. And how far and how fast is the only question. We know we have to do something about it. Well, one of the things that we can do is go back 
to the equivalent of our wood burning days. Nobody's going to say use wood only as fuel. But we can go back to our wood burning days in the sense that wood, this wood of this podium, is carbon that has come out of the air. The tree has grown. As it grows, it sucks carbon out. It turns it into a solid form, and we use it. If we burn this podium, we wouldn't be adding to carbon that wasn't there 100 years ago. We would take this carbon that was there 50 to 100 years in the atmosphere and return it. It is a sustainable process to take carbon from the air, make a solid material out of it, and return it back. It's not taking carbon that was buried forever. And the reason I mention that is the first and I think biggest use of biotechnology, our knowledge of the diversity of life is going to be for energy. Energy by far is the most massive thing that we do. Just think of the massive oil tankers that come to our shores, the carbon that we pull out in, in train loads and train loads of, uh, of, uh, of uh, boxcars of, of trains. It's an enormous amount of physical material. The infrastructure, I visited the largest chemical refinery recently built in India largest one in the world. It's almost the size of Manhattan, just that single refinery to help fuel India and its carbon needs. What are we learning? I've been an advisor to a group at the University of California at Berkeley that began to realize that the chemistry that happens within a microorganism is now fully within our hands. What we used to be able to do only in big steel vats or in glass tubes, we can now begin to do in microorganisms. It began with a simple project. The project was to create a new pharmaceutical to treat malaria. And what a very brilliant scientist did at Berkeley was realize he could take enzymes, different steps that transformed a chemical from one form to another to another, from different sources. He could use his computer to look in what was known from the world of microbiology. And if he needed to take a chemical from A to B, he could do it with the product of a gene. Might be from a plant, might be from a bacteria, might be from a yeast. And he strung a series of those together so that he could now produce this anti-malaria drug. I began to talk with him. He said, what else can we make that's valuable? I said, how about making gasoline? How about making diesel fuel? And within a couple of weeks, he'd drawn out a pathway to allow a yeast not to make ethanol, but to make diesel fuel or gasoline. And that was two years ago, and now those organisms exist. There are organisms that produce, instead of ethanol, they produce diesel fuel, and they produce gasoline. In addition to that, it would be very useful not to have to feed it sugar, but to feed it any carbon source, wood, cellulose. Again, that was a very relatively simple process. Go through all that's known, and what wasn't known, sequence a few other organisms, like the organisms inside the gut of a termite that chew up and turn wood into sugar, and put that process into the same organism. And now you feed it wood, and it produces diesel fuel and gasoline. And then there was one other step. Instead of keeping it inside the organism, you want it to come out. And it turns out that antibiotic resistant, which is such a big problem, was a boon here because one of the ways that works is it takes these compounds and pumps them out very fast. So instead of the antibiotic staying in your cell, it gets pumped out. We know what does that, what is the little structure, the genes that make the structure of the pump. So you add that, and now you have a complete system. You feed it wood, it pumps out gasoline. And there are cars now running around San Francisco that are fueled by that process. So it can be done. We can take the carbon from the atmosphere, turn it into a useful fuel, and perhaps move to a liquid fuel economy which is independent of fossil fuels. That is a big difference. Now the question that this group has asked me to address is who owns that? Who will own that future? Will it be the people who discovered the original genes? Will it be those who have engineered them into an efficient pathway? Will it be the companies that produce these organisms so they make it efficiently? 
Or will it be the huge mega companies of today that produce oil that have the resources and the infrastructure to make a new infrastructure or adapt an existing infrastructure for that purpose? The answer to that question isn't fully known. We don't know the answer to the question. We know the answer to some of the questions. We know there are companies that are being formed. Now, there are a number of companies that are being formed that are trying to do something like that. There are some companies, in fact, that are trying to bypass the wood for cellul need for cellulose. They are taking sunlight, photosynthesis, and directly turning it into an energy source. So they're trying to take this, the energy from the sun without going through a cellulose intermediate, couple that to the processes. Will they be the winners? We don't know the answer to that. But what we do know is for this system to work, there have to be a series of incentives. Are the patents the right incentives? Are limited monopolies of another side? Are government subsidies the right incentive? Those are questions that are going to be vitally debated, not just in the United States, but in all countries. Because energy and our environment is vital to our future. But it is the power of life to transform chemistry, to transform chemicals from one to the other. Our ability to read this information and to use it that has opened up this new possibility. I know in Europe, and particularly in Europe, in Europe, the topic of food and modified foods is a topic of some debate. But if you look around the world at what's happening with our application of knowledge for agriculture, whether it is food or whether it is material, such as new forms of cotton or various plants. There are certainly, we have the ability to modify not just microorganisms that make useful chemicals, but we have the ability to modify our foods. And what can we do with that knowledge? Well, we can improve nutritional content. There are many foods like corn, which can be made much more nutritious by adding one or two essential amino acids. There are micronutrient shortage in many countries around the world, which can be addressed. There are a number of antioxidants that can be beneficial for your health that can be introduced into a wide variety of foods. That is on the nutrition side. On the agronomic side, you can dramatically increase yield. You can reduce the need for water. You can make plants that are temperature resistant or cold resistant. You can make plants that grow in a saline environment. You can make plants that are insecticide, insect resistant and that don't make their own fertilizer. And all of those steps are in progress. There are some that think that should never happen, that it's a violation of the environment. There are other and many environmentalists that believe unless we do that, unless we make agriculture more productive, unless we are, walk more gently upon the land than we do with conventional agriculture, i.e. pesticides, herbicides, and plowing, because much of this agriculture is no plow agriculture, unless we use our new technology to treat the land more economically and more gently than we do, we will destroy whatever natural environments we have. So if you talk to people at Conservation International, the Nature Conservancy, you will find advocates for this type of agriculture. The question is really no longer up to the Western countries. Who is most advanced and most aggressive about the use of these technologies are countries not in the United States or Europe. It is India and it is China. I've traveled to their laboratories. I've seen what they do. I, and Brazil, for example, they have very large tracts of their land under cultivation with these organisms. What you in Europe do, what we in the United States do, how this technology gets used, how dangerous it may, may be to the rest of the environment, are again questions that are going to be very hotly debated. And who owns that technology? is again going to be hotly debated. At first it appeared as large American corporations would be the owners, and that certainly didn't set well here or other places. 
But that isn't what it looks like today. It looks like if it is owned and if it is proprietary at all, it will mostly be Indian and Chinese companies that do it. And it's not clear whether they're going to restrict ownership or not yet. Those are questions that remain uh, for the future. What about the intricate nature of life? Well, many of you may have heard that the future of engineering is not at the top, it's at the bottom. We're trying to make things smaller and smaller. We know that from our computers. We know that from the cell phones that have shrunk to this big to that big. From computers that used to fill a room this size to one that's 100 times more powerful that you put on your lap or carry in your pocket. And that's an ever-shrinking reality. In some senses, it's a good reality because it means as there are more people, we can get by with fewer materials. Think, just think back to the size of industrial machines at the, end of the, at the beginning of the last century, these enormous Victorian plants. Well, we don't see that so much for manufacturing. We see a much subtler kind of manufacturing. And what I'm going to tell you is we're going to move to a much subtler form of manufacturing still. Because if you can build a microbe or a forest from tiny parts, you can build anything from tiny parts. And the information and how to do that is locked into living systems. And we are now unlocking the secrets of how to do that. A tree is made from very tiny parts. As I said, just one or 2,000 atoms in a very particular array that assemble themselves and build a tree. Well, we're now beginning to understand how to, that is done and how to use that to manufacture almost anything we want to manufacture. Let me just give you one or two applications. One of the things that is badly needed as we shrink our electronics are connectors, little tiny wires that connect one piece of electronic component to another. We actually need to shrink our electronic components as well. It's hard to imagine that we're going to shrink them below the size of an atom, but we may well shrink them to one or two atoms in dimension. And what does that? Living system do that. There are already people who are building micro wires. You use a biological system to build a tiny little structure, and you put single atoms of metal along it, and you have a nice, tiny constructor. In fact, because DNA has information that not only can allow it to stick this way, but if you do it right, allow it to stack geometrically, you can use DNA to build three-dimensional structures. And you put metal or other atoms on those, and you have a three-dimensional structure of almost any shape or size you want. So we are now beginning to be the architects of the atomic world using the knowledge and, in many cases, the actual abilities of living systems. Our new factories will be fermenters. We will be growing up large vats of micro parts, which will then self-assemble into whatever structure we want. We will be able to build the equivalent of metal, of plastic, of wood, in any shape, at any size that we want. That will be the new manufacturing. Manufacturing will be largely a matter of growth, where you take small things and make them bigger, not take small, big things and make them smaller. That is a fundamental revolution in how we use, how we interact with the material world. And again, there will be a number of questions of who owns that technology. Will it be the material? Will it be the process? Will it be a combination of the material and the process that leads to our ability to use that as a, uh, in, in, in a business? It's a question that I think remains uh, to be answered. Then finally, there's a question that I touched on briefly, which is immortality. It would be great, some of us think, to live forever. Now, I know from talking to many people that that's not commonly shared. Some people say it's fine to die. Well, if the nature of life is immortality, why isn't that we can't have it? 
Why is it that our DNA has this privilege and we don't? And it isn't, I'm not going to tell you that we can see immortality now, but we are moving to a new type of medicine based on the knowledge that we have that will certainly keep us, most of us who have access to this medicine, in relatively good shape for well over 100, maybe 120 years. And we are beginning to glimpse the notion that we can extend that by two or threefold without a real effort, and possibly much, much longer. So let me just go through some of those steps about how we think about that process. I've called this new field regenerative medicine. Uh, it's a mixture of many, many different types of medical advance. Some of them don't even have to do with biology. Some of them have to do with materials, micro electronics that will replace our retinas, uh, systems that would allow us to repair, send signals to our brain to allow our limbs to move uh, if we've uh, been impaired. Some of them are very similar to the pills you take today. Some of them are genes, proteins. Some of them are cells, and some of them are stem cells. But let me just tell you about one conceptual advance that was made over the last few years. I have known, and other people who think about this have known, that there is a miracle of life, in a way, and that is that two adults, let's say they're 30 years old, can combine their genes and their cells to produce a cell that's zero years old. That has to happen. Every time somebody has a baby or a new plant is born or a new animal is born, the genetic clock is reset to zero. That's how immortality happens. So the sperm, which is 30 years old, the egg, which is 30 years old, get together, and what materializes is a zero-year-old egg. Well, we've known that you can turn back that clock. It had to be. And I imagined, at some point, we would learn what those processes were. And in fact, it came in a blinding revelation about three years ago, maybe almost four years ago. A Japanese scientist found it was very simple to do. Four simple gene products is all it took puts them into any cell in your body, and it turns it right back to a fertilized egg that is zero years old. So you can take any cell. You can take your skin, a cell that makes the hair, a cell that makes your bone, a cell that makes your blood, add these four genes, and you have the equivalent of a fertilized egg. Now, nobody's done this with a human, but if you do that with a mouse and you take that cell and you put it into a mouse womb, you will get a whole mouse that's alive and is first is zero years old and it grows up to be a normal mouse. So that can happen with any of your cells. Now, combine that with one view of aging. One view of aging, and not the only view, and I'll tell you another view in a minute, is that aging is a process of destruction of the cells that replace your normal tissues. We know that our skin is normally replaced. Well, what's doing that? It's a type of cell called a stem cell, a skin stem cell in this case, that has the ability to make all the different types of skin cells. One view of aging is those skin cells, stem cells, accumulate damage over time and then no longer can make skin. And that happens throughout your body. That is one and probably the most popular view, doesn't mean it's right, but probably the most popular view of aging. And if that is what's driving aging, then the ability to take any one of your cells, revert it to zero, move it forward, has in concept the ability to rejuvenate all of your body indefinitely. And that is a real prospect. It is not an imaginary thing. There are laboratories all over the world now beginning to work on exactly that use of stem cells, not as you think of them for just building an organ or a tissue, but to actually build yourself a younger body. Now, we can't say that's going to happen soon. It's unlikely to happen very soon. But the concept that it can happen now, and that we have it in our power to do that, is very real and tangible. And it's enough that young scientists around the world are now engaged in the process of understanding how that might work. Let me take a slightly different approach toward aging. 
We know, and we've now learned, starting from very simple organisms and moving up the ladder to more complicated organisms, that there's something that's relatively simple that can extend the lifespan of an organism, two, three, sometimes tenfold. And that is restriction on caloric intake, how many calories you take in. If you're a little worm, you can, by restricting the amount of calories it takes in, have it live 10 times longer than it normally would. And it is a healthy worm. It's living not just longer, it is living healthy. People did that with fruit flies. They found it lived four or five times longer. They've done it with mice. You calorically restrict the mouse, and that mouse will live three or four times longer than its litter mate or its identical twin that has been fed a normal diet. Now, you look at that mouse and you say, well, is it a, just old and sick? No, it doesn't have cancer at the same rate. Its muscles are strong, its fur looks fine, it runs around, it seems just as intelligent. Now let's take a primate. It's recently a very long study, this takes a long time. A group of, let me say, late middle aged monkeys. That probably, uh, most of us in the room. Middle to late middle aged monkeys, we're very similar, our cousins. Were caloric restricted. And they were found that the lifespan of those monkeys has been, been dramatically extended. And again, if you look at heart disease, as far as you can tell, brain disease, and incidence of cancer, it's dramatically reduced. So between these two processes, now we're beginning to try to understand it. There's a tremendous effort to try to understand this biology. How do we understand what are those chemical processes that when there's an excess number of calories, more than we need to just live, that the body burns itself up or somehow consumes itself at a faster rate? The hope is that you're not going to have to be caloric restricted, but that we will have a pill that does the same. And they are now, there are a couple of very interesting, uh, let me say, leads that have been found that seem to do almost the same thing as caloric restriction. So the first thing that most of us may experience, and may even experience in our lifetime, in the not too far distant future, are drugs that we take that do the somewhat the equivalent of caloric restriction, to take you from a lifespan of, say, 90 years to a lifespan of 120 years. Beyond that, there are a series of advances, both the advances I mentioned by using your own cells, by using that knowledge to actually stimulate cells in place, not ones you put in, to assume a younger and more youthful uh, function, to reset the clock, as it were, in place. Those are the kinds of things that modern biology as is beginning to do. So who will own that future? It's, again, a real question. We don't know the answer. The fundamental technology for creating stem cells was patented. Courts in some parts of the world have invalidated those patents. The technology for moving a stem cell to, say, a neuron, useful possibly for treatment of Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, has been patented. Will those patents stand or not? Somebody may own that future. Let me just say a word about patents, uh, because that underlies a lot of the discussion of ownership. The history of patents is an interesting history. The current form of patents, and there were actually predecessors of patents that go all the way back to the Greeks, maybe even the Egyptians, but certainly back to the Greeks. But the current form of patents, as we know it, was codified by the Venetians at a very important time in their history. The Venetians were very interested in acquiring the knowledge that was then in the Ottoman and the uh, Mameluk, Mameluk empires, in Egypt and in Turkey. They were relatively far behind. That was a great repository of classical and applied knowledge. And they wanted to bring those workmen to Venice and have them set up shop. And they made a deal with them. They said, 
you come to Venice and teach us everything you know about how to make it, and we will give you a limited time protection. For as long as you're alive, we'll protect you. When you die, you will have taught us everything you know, but you don't get protected unless you teach us everything you know. And that was the deal that they struck, and that is the fundamental basis of a patent. A patent is not a secret. The patent is the opposite of a secret. Today in patent law, if you don't teach every little detail of what you know, your patent is invalid. A patent is a tool of society to spread knowledge, but to protect the inventor and to make it economically viable. Now, in the United States, the way that has been manifest is in our Constitution. Our Constitution mandates that we give patents. And the reason for that, Benjamin Franklin, I think, summed it up very effectively. He said, a patent adds the fuel of self-interest to the fire of invention. The fuel of self-interest the fire of invention. And I can tell you from being involved in universities and being involved in biotechnology and many startup companies that that fuel of self-interest is powerful. People may be altruistic as they are as professors, but if you want something effected and done with utmost human power and ingenuity, self-interest is a very good way to do it, and that was codified in our Constitution. So how does that apply to the living world? Well, it's inconceivable that you would pro pro patent a human being, and no one would, and it cannot be done. You can't patent a natural plant as well. You can only patent the act of mankind. You can only patent an art practiced by a human being. If it's a natural element, it's not patentable. But if it is a natural element rearranged in some new way that is useful, then it's patentable. You cannot patent knowledge, for example. A patent has to have several features. It has to be novel. Nobody can ever have ha had it before. It has to be useful. If a patent does not have a use, you cannot have it. You cannot patent pure knowledge. And then you have to teach everything you know. And if you leave out the salt for how to make the special cake, you don't have a patent. You've got to teach them how to make salt. It is an oddity that if you really want to know about the technical world, you don't go to the scientific literature. You don't go to the trade magazines. You go to the patent literature. Because there, every little detail must be spelled out. So when it came to the question of something like aspirin, which is a purified compound from a plant. The US Supreme Court ruled that it was patentable even though it was made by the plant, even though the plant had it in it before. Because the act of ingenuity was to recognize it was there, create a process to purify it, and then to use it to relieve pain or something else. So in fact, those things made by living systems can be patented. That was the US ruling. Now, in Europe, they had a very different view, as I understand it. It was, you may not be able to patent the composition, but you can patent the use of aspirin. And that's a different idea. The process by which you extract it and its use can be patented, but not the substance. And that difference still exists in the relative patent laws. So then the question came, somebody created an organism that ate up oil. Is the entire organism patented? And the ruling in the US courts, and in many courts around the world, was yes. Because you took something that could not have been done before, through an act of ingenuity, turned it into something that was now useful for human use, and you taught somebody how to do it. And that is the sort of the criterion, the, the fundamental criteria you have to think about as you think about who owns this biological future? First of all, a patent is not ownership. So no, the re real answer to the question 
is nobody will own the biological future because the patent is limited in time. That's the first thing to say. Second thing to say is that you've got to consider human need in terms of what it is that motivates people to make investments and to do certain kinds of work. And self-interest is a very powerful motivator. And there are many, many examples. I won't go into all the examples, but I just think sitting here in Berlin and thinking about one half of the city and the other half of the city at a time when self-interest was rampant and self-interest was not necessarily fulfilled, you saw enormous differences in the two halves of the city. It was like an experiment in the benefits of, uh, of uh, say, limited and controlled self-interest. The deeper questions are what we will do with this real power that we have. We now know the power of life. We have it in our hands to use this power of life. We will and are using it, hopefully, to make our world better. Uh, but it can make, and we can see, how it could make our world a nightmare as well. And I think the previous speaker re referred to some of those uh, aspects when you were talking about your pre-implantation diagnostics. Some people would see that as a nightmare, and some people would see that as a blessing. Let me just address that question quite directly. I gave a speech once, maybe 20 years ago, 15 to 20 years ago, in Aspen, Colorado, at a workshop. And I said, I don't think that we will, in the near future, even if we have the power reach in and change a disease-causing gene in human beings. And I expected that that comment would receive a favorable response, change it forever, so every descendant would have eliminated, through human manipulation of a fertilized egg, a gene that would cause a disease like Huntington's. Afterwards, I was assailed by a group of people who said, how could you be so arrogant? And then they gave personal stories, one after another, of terrible tragedies in their own families of inherited disease. So there was one family with cancer genes. There was another family with Alzheimer's genes. There was another family with Huntington's disease. Terrible inherited disease. And they said, if you have the ability to cure it through technologies and you don't, then you shouldn't have your job. You are morally irresponsible. There were those also who felt exactly the opposite. Don't fiddle with humanity. Don't fiddle with human nature. There is no end of that slippery slope. Those are questions obviously I cannot answer. You cannot answer, but we collectively must answer. It's not only who owns this knowledge, who uses this knowledge, it's how we use this knowledge that is really the question that is the most important one uh, for us today. And as a beginning toward that end, I'm happy that here at Convoco we're in a situation where we can have a dialogue. And I'm happy to uh, answer questions that uh, you may have. Thank you very much.